uh, of uh, the precious uh, servants from the land of the Philippines, and I um, uh, was really excited uh, when I first received this invitation uh, to come and join you. Um, now, is this my microphone also on? <laughs> well, I have double double acoustics here. You know, I, I noticed something when I when I came. Uh, you are celebrating your 11th anniversary, and you have chosen the 11th chapter from the book of Isaiah. That is very very clever. Uh, help, helps me to remember the, uh, the the year of your anniversary. You know, the, the prophet Isaiah is uh, one, of, one of the great prophets uh, in the land uh, of Israel. And uh, this prophet, it, there's a lot of controversy uh, amongst theologians as to who wrote the book. Because, you know, in the prophet Isaiah, there is such a massive distinction in the style and the writing of this book very briefly to say it like this, that the first, from chapters 1 through 39, it's written about a lot of judgment and the anger of God, how Israel was seeking after the, uh, the worship of idols and Baal, and, and he brought his judgment upon them. And the last uh, 20 verses, uh, 27 uh, chapters, it talks about how God will restore and heal and bring back the children of Israel to himself. And he begins to describe even how he will do that through his uh, servant who would come, Yeshua, who would come and die on the cross on behalf of his people. So it's right there that you have chosen in Isaiah the 11th chapter when, when we read this story, and if you could turn there with me uh, to Isaiah uh, 11, because there is actually a, a little bit of a mixture of both judgment and a prophetic picture of God's grace and mercy combined together. And it says here in the first two verses, And there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. You know, this verse right here, we could say, is a picture, one of the early pictures a proclamation that the Messiah is coming, that the Lord and his promises to bring forth the Mashiach to Israel will come forth. And if we consider and look at the history of Israel and we read the biblical passage, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the names of, of Simeon and Anna. These two precious saints lived in Jerusalem, and they spent many years waiting for the promise. Simeon was told that in his older age, that before he dies, that he would see the coming of the Messiah. It says of Anna, who was the age of 84, that this woman served the Lord uh, from the time she lost her husband in prayer and fasting at the temple. And you know what happened? One day, both Mary and Joseph came in to dedicate their child. And there was Simeon, led by the Spirit of God, and the Lord revealed to him, this is the promised one. So I believe when we look at a verse like this in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, this is a promise of the coming of Messiah, the promise that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and anoint him. We, we, we see it in, in many places uh, throughout uh, the uh, prophet Isaiah where he writes in the 42nd uh, chapter, Behold my servant 
whom I will uphold, my spirit will rest upon him. And there again in Isaiah, the 61st, 61st chapter, but I love this verse where it, the, the Lord is saying, for the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. See, God is looking for a resting place. The Spirit of God wants to come upon his children. And when we read here in Isaiah, the reality is that in some translations, my, my Bible says, and they shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. You know, the, this English word can be translated into uh, a tree trunk, a little stub of a tree, a tree that has been violently or just simply cut down. It's interesting that in the earlier chapter, chapter 10 of Isaiah, God is speaking about the Assyrian nation and he uses a, a picture of the great forest in Lebanon, how the, the Assyrians will be like the Lebanon forest, which is cut down and totally destroyed. All the trees are just cut down at the stem. So what we see here is a combination of a little bit of hopelessness. Can you imagine a thriving oak tree? An oak tree or a cypress tree that has been cut down at the roots. Just a stump. It's a picture, I believe, of hopelessness. You know, I've been blessed. I, I hear that in the last 11 years, this congregation has moved 11 different times. You know, it was in 19... Uh, 92, excuse me, not 11 times, four times, in 11 years, four times. You know, the, the, the Lord has blessed me when I came to Israel. I mean, I live on probably my address is the same as yours. Actually, my, uh, my address needs to be your address because I live in a place called Hagefin. And you know what Hagefin means? It means the vine. And haven't we been called to abide in the vine? And so, actually, in all the years that I have lived in Israel, serving at a drug rehabilitation center, serving drug addicts, alcoholics, the homeless, the outcasts of Israel, I have lived for the last 27 plus years in the exact same place. That is what you call abiding in the vine under a whole forgetting. But where I live, I live on the side of the mountain on Mount Carmel. And I have a backyard that is probably maybe three or four times the size of this room. It's my own personal backyard. The Lord has blessed me uh, with a place. I, I don't rent this house. I don't, um, it's not my own personal property, but it belongs to the ministry center. But the back of the property is a private area, and it's, it's where my family has lived for the last 27 years. But the reason I mention that is because on that property, there is one of the biggest cypress trees or pine trees probably in all of Israel. I, I promise you that this tree is probably in the top 100 of all of Israel as one of the biggest trees in the land. That was about 15 years ago. There was a massive fire in the back of our property. And I was so full of fear that embers and flames from this fire would come and touch my tree and ignite the entire tree on fire. Well, that was my fear, but it never happened. And I tell you that story to give you a sense of this picture. There is a stump, a cut down tree. And this tree represents the house of Jesse. Now Jesse, can you imagine Jesse's mother was a Moabite. 
she lived somewhere in the land uh, of Jordan. It wasn't Jesse's mother, it was Jesse's great great grandmother. Her name was Ruth. And Ruth made a commitment to come to this land and to say that your God shall be my God. And when I, when I think of uh, the, the commitment of the men and the women from the Philippines who have come here, I, I, I think of Ruth. I think of a woman who left her people, who left her God to come into this nation and to serve. And in the end, God took the life of Ruth and richly blessed her. And she became uh, the great-great-grandmother, the great-great-grandmother of what would later become the king of Israel. Because Jesse was the father of David. And so when we see here the, 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 uh, the, the, the stump of Jesse, I mean, think about this history. When, when do we first meet Jesse in the historical books. Well, if you know your Bibles, and I, I think we've got some Bible scholars here, it's amazing how well you guys study the Word of God, whether it be online or the great uh, studying from book to book. It's a beautiful picture. But it's really in 1 Samuel, uh, we, we see when the prophet Samuel is called to go to a place to Bethlehem because the first king of Israel has rebelled against God. King Saul, who had a spirit of rebellion, God said, I, I need to find a, a new man who will be the king of Israel. And so he sent the great prophet Samuel to Jesse, to Jesse's house. And Jesse had eight children. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you today that my family, which I left behind in the United States to come to what I believe was the call of God upon my life to serve in this land, I come from a family of eight children. And you know, of the eight children in Jesse's family, the youngest of all the children was David. Well, my brothers and sisters, they still call me the baby of the family. I'm the, I'm the youngest of eight years old in my family. But can you imagine on the day that the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's house in Bethlehem, he came there to anoint the next king of Israel. And in the fullness of time, through trials and tribulations, David would later take the throne first in Hebron and then uh, up in, uh, in Jerusalem. He would become the leader of the land and the nation of Israel. We know after his death, after Solomon built the temple, the country, the nation, the land was divided in two. The northern tribes fell into sin. Later, Judah would fall into judgment and be taken away captive into Babylon. This is the picture of the, 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 the stump, the cut down tree of Jesse. This is a picture of God's judgment upon the land. When, when we think of the stump, the history of Jesse from David being chosen king from once living in the palace in Jerusalem and in the future generations being cast off into captivity. This is the picture. And yet, from this tragedy, from this place of absolute hopelessness, what looks like in the natural, my goodness, if that tree in my backyard had ever caught fire, I would have been heartbroken. I would have been filled with sadness. And now, in this nation, this is what it looked like back in those days. But through the prophetic word of Isaiah the prophet, he said, yes, judgment is coming. But there is a promise for out of the trunk, out of the stub of Jesse, there will shoot forth a sprout. There will be new life that will spring forth. 
we can call it today in this New Testament era, it's almost like a release of resurrection power. See, this is the God who we serve. There is a release of his spirit of resurrection power. Now, as we were worshiping here tonight, and I heard a few bits and pieces of some of the testimonies, one of the things I heard was this. In the last 11 years, there have been some trials. There have been some difficulties. It hasn't been easy being together. You've moved around a little bit here and there. You've had to find different places. Corporately, this is one of the things that has happened. But I know individually, as you've served in various families, it hasn't been an easy road. It hasn't been an easy journey for any one of you. But God, he is faithful. God is faithful. And even in the midst of the hopeless situation, even as we see this picture of the cut down tree, what looks like hopelessness, suddenly a green shoot emerges. There is a release of a newness of life. As brothers and sisters, we need to know that we need to rejoice Whenever we fall into various trials or difficulties, we need to rejoice in the Lord, knowing that the testing of our faith will produce in us those things which God wants to bring about in our lives, so we will lack nothing. Let us rejoice in our hardships. Let us rejoice in the trials and difficulties that, that we may go through. But here it was in, in, in the shoot of the trunk that, that springs forth into newness of life. Turn with me, as we, we, we look here in Isaiah, turn, turn with me to a promise that's found in the book of Revelation. Because if we want to identify in Isaiah, what, what, what is uh, the, this, this a picture of what is uh, this tree trunk? What is this shoot of newness of life? It says here in the book of Revelation, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals thereof. Hallelujah. Here we see uh, a picture, a description, a title of our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And who is he? This is a, a clear reference from Isaiah, the 11th chapter, the root of David. Hallelujah. What an awesome picture. And what does it say here uh, about Yeshua, this title, the root of David? And he has prevailed. Hallelujah. I love this word. That he has prevailed. Yeshua has gotten the victory. Yeshua has triumphed. And brothers and sisters, the word of God says that through him we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Brothers and sisters, no matter what your struggle may be, no matter what you may be going through individually or corporately as a body, know this, that even as the root of Jesse has prevailed, hallelujah, we too who are connected to Yeshua and the promises that he has given to us, that no matter what our circumstances in him, in him we have the victory. We are more than conquerors. Yeah. Now, what, what we see here is, is a beautiful picture of, I, I love this expression. It says here in the second uh, uh, verse, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might spirit of knowledge 
and the fear of the Lord. When, when, I, when I, I, I think of all these characteristics, these, this picture of transformation, a picture of a changed life. You know, I, I am working at a place, it's called Beit Nitzahon in Hebrew, it's called the, the House of Victory. It's a place where men who are living under the shadow of death, in a place, in places of darkness, people who were bound uh, by drugs and alcohol, a place of absolute hopelessness. What I've seen is that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them through repentance, through faith in Yeshua, through the washing and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, there was and there is and there will be a transformation in an individual's character. We read in the book of Galatians the, the destructive power of the sin nature. You know what it is. You've probably read it. You've studied it. It's there in Galatians chapter 5. But for those who have the Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord is resting upon them, we heard it earlier, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Can you imagine that? And the, and the nine, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But of that long list, the second one on the list is joy. I love that. How important is joy? Well, it's right there after love. Brothers and sisters, what I've seen tonight, what I've heard is the sound of joy in this house. And may the joy of the Lord be our strength. But what we see here in Isaiah, what we just read, and the spirit of of the Lord shall rest upon him. Oh, hallelujah. I, I love this when you heard a little bit of my testimony or um, in the introduction. Uh, I, I, I worked in New York City with drug addicts on the streets. I uh, raised up a team. We were going down before the COVID-19 out, uh, outbreak. We were there for three, four, five years going to the streets. We've been doing it actually for the last since I've been in Israel, uh, this is the work of the House of Victory. We're just doing it then in a, in a, in a, in a place and on a regular basis. But Yeshua said, and I quoted the verse earlier, the Spirit of the Lord God resting upon us because he has anointed us. Not only does the Spirit of God want to anoint us, the Spirit of God wants to change us. And the question is this, you know, John the Baptist, when he was down by the Jordan River, and he knew that his mission, that his task, what was given to him by the Lord, was that he would make a way for the coming of the Lord. And so in making a way for the coming of the Lord, he, he knew the time was getting near, and he cried out, God, I mean, how am I going to know? How am I going to know it's the Messiah? How will I recognize him? And what did the Spirit of God say to him? The one in whom the Spirit will remain upon, he is the one. Brothers and sisters, we need to have a character transformation. And that character transformation can only come about as the Spirit of God is working in our lives. When the Spirit of God moves upon us, we will be changed. Now, I, I love uh, the passage earlier in 1 Samuel. We spoke about, unfortunately, how King Saul fell. But in the early days when he was with the prophet Samuel, and the Samuel anointed him with fresh oil. The Bible says that Samuel told him, and you go down and you'll meet the prophets and you'll be singing with them. And when you join them, and he says, the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will become a new man. You will become a new man or a new person, a new woman. Oh, 
how we need the Spirit of God in our lives. Later in the prophet Isaiah, in the 66th chapter. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there and you can look at it and read it with me. In Isaiah 66, the, the, the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, The Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Where is the place of my rest? That's a challenging question that I believe in God's gentle way. He wants to confront us tonight. In your lifestyle, in the way that you've been living, has the Holy Spirit found a resting place in your life? Now, oftentimes when I'm teaching the men of the House of Victory, I, I, I think of three specific places in, in the New Testament when it talks about the Holy Spirit. The first martyr, Stephan, said and cried out in Jerusalem. He said, you are like your fathers. You've always resisted the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this cannot be a characteristic of those who are trying to create a resting place for the living God. We can't resist his still, small voice. He wants to speak to us. He wants to lead us. He wants to give us revelation. He wants to give us understanding of the character of who Yeshua is. Oh, let's not resist the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, and in the context when he said it, when he wrote it, was simply the words people were speaking. And he said to them that we, we can grieve, we can hurt, we can cause the Holy Spirit to sort of be in pain simply by the words we speak one to another. We need to be careful to guard our lips because we know this, that every word we speak, it flows from our hearts. The book of Proverbs says that we need to guard our hearts because in it are the issues of life. Oh yes, let us not get to that place where we will grieve the spirit of the living God. And there's another place. It says in the book of, and I understand you're studying First Thessalonians, right? You're in the book right now. Have you made it to, I think it's the fourth chapter. I think it's 417 where it says these words, and do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. What does that mean? But whenever you see that English word quench, it always means to put out a fire. And we live here today, and you sang the song, these are the days of Elijah. The days of Elijah, the fire fell. Fire of God fell on Mount Carmel. What an awesome place. One of the greatest places in the history, the biblical history of Israel. The prophet Elijah on this mountain called down the holy fire from God. And there's a warning in the book of Thessalonians. Do not put out God's fire. What an honor for all of us, for myself, for you included, to be called to this holy mountain. You know, I know when the tourists come to Israel, it's, it's amazing. I mean, nobody really comes here. It's, you know, they get a 10-day tour package. They don't have time to come to Mount Carmel. There are more important things to be doing. But don't forget this. When Yeshua had a visitation from heaven and two of the great saints came down and met with Jesus, who did he hang out with? Who was he sitting with? He sat with Moshe and Eliyahu, Elijah the prophets. He is, after Moses, 
the greatest prophet in all of Israel. Oh, and how the spirit and power of Elijah wants to rest upon us. So this is what we see here in, in the book of Isaiah, this description of Messiah, the one where the spirit of God would rest upon him. And when I, when I think of these characteristic transformations, it depends on this one, you know, yeah, you know what a fulcrum is, where you, where you have a, a piece of wood that's resting on something, you can, this is how they built the ancient base, this is how they built heavy stone buildings, where they use this fulcrum where you get a board and you push on you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Everything rested on that point. See, the important thing about this character development is a place of rest. And if the Holy Spirit can find a place of rest in our lives, oh hallelujah, we will be changed. We will be transformed. You know, I actually first was introduced to the um, serving in the Philippine congregations uh, by one of the lead pastors, one of the founding uh, pastors on the Carmel Congregation, and that is um, Pastor Peter Sukihira. And Pastor Peter was recently teaching uh, at Carmel Congregation, and he was speaking on prayer in the, in the latter times, in the latter days. And he began, and Peter doesn't often talk about eschatology, the end times, but it's good every once in a while for us to get a focus or a look for what, what the Bible calls in John the 16th chapter, what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us. It says in John 16, 13, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you things to come. But as Pastor Peter was talking about those things to come, he spoke about a term called birth pangs. Birth pangs when a woman uh, is ready to have a child. And uh, I don't know, men, we haven't been there, right? We don't know how painful it is. But it goes something like this. It's one of the most painful things in the world, they say, okay? But what Pastor Peter said, and this is what they teach, the doctors teach women that when you are delivering a child and you're having those birth pains and you're crying out and it hurts in between, you need to rest. You need to rest. <laughs> Come to a place of rest. Because you know what the reality is? Another one's coming. Another one is coming. And another one after that. Brothers and sisters, we have been called to such a place as this. A place where we will see in the front row, the front line of battle, the things that are coming upon the ends of the earth. They will be happening here. And we need to learn to enter. In Israel, they use the expression, the Shabbat rest. Well, I'm not quite sure still after all these years. I'm not a Jewish background. I'm, I'm a Gentile. But what I do know is the value and the importance of coming in to a place of rest. God wants to take us there. God wants to bring that upon us. And so when, it, when, I, when I think of the offshoot uh, of, the, of this uh, tree trunk, one of the key expressions that, 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 I, that I see here, um, going back to verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow forth from its roots. Brothers and sisters, this is a, uh, how could I say, an important question we need to ask ourselves. Here was this tree that was cut down in a hopeless place. And the Bible describes a hopeless place according to the prophet Ezekiel 
that hopeless place is called the valley of dry bones. Those valley, that valley of dry bones is the whole house of Israel. And they say that our bones are dry. We have lost our hope. We are cut off. Now, I work amongst men who have come out of the valley of dry bones. And the reality is this. Many of you are working uh, with, with elderly people who have come to a place in their life where there is a sense of hopelessness. There is no hope for them. They have no future. Their time is limited. It's a sad place and a sad journey. The book of Ephesians says that there was a time as we Gentiles that we were without God and we were without hope in this life. It's a terrible place to be. And the stump of David, the stump of Jesse is that place of hopelessness. The men in our program, the elderly that you serve here in this nation. But oh, brothers and sisters, if we have a root system, if we have a place that goes deep down into the soil of the earth, in, in Psalm chapter one, uh, we, we know this uh, Psalm, it, it says, oh, to be like a tree which is planted by the rivers, it will bring forth its fruit in season. But turn with me uh, to Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. In Jeremiah 17, verse 8. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be full of fear and anxieties even in the year of drought. And neither shall they cease from yielding fruits. We think of this stump of Jesse, this place of hopelessness. But the power isn't in the surface because God does not look at the outer man but he looks at the things of the heart and if there is a place in our heart where we made a resting place for the Lord we have a root system that goes deep 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 into the spirit of the living God and we will be like that tree planted by the rivers of living water. But here in Jeremiah, it says that even when there is a drought, even when the rain doesn't fall, there shall be no fear, no anxieties, and there will continue to be a fruitfulness. Brothers and sisters, I believe that if we have the root system, in Yeshua, then the Spirit of God can find a resting place in our lives. And there will be a fruit that will be abounding in our lives, a fruit that will remain. And you know how important this is? Because the Word of God says that they will know that you are my disciples by your love. Hallelujah. You're, you're serving. You're, you're, you're preciously serving people who are in desperate need. And it takes from you strength. It takes uh, uh, spirit. Uh, it, it requires spirit of power and might. The question is, do you have the joy? Do you have the love? Do they see something in you, something in, in, in you that could maybe give them 
hope that they would ask of you questions. It says of, of Caleb, who came into this land. Caleb was of a different spirit. Brothers and sisters, are you of a dis different spirit? You know, it was in 1992 in Broadway, in New York City. Here I am working with the homeless in New York City. And I get invited to dinner on Broadway in New York City. And I get invited there to meet with a man who was formerly a professor at a place called Fordham University. Well, you may not know Fordham University, but there was a student in that school who today is one of the greatest actors in Hollywood. And the man that I was about to have lunch with or dinner was his professor, his instructor in the drama department. And that man that I met with, his name was David Davis. And David Davis was the pastor of our congregation. And he was sent from David Wilkerson from New York City. He was sent to Israel to stop the rehab. And now he's back in New York and he's looking for workers. Oh, by the way, the student from Hollywood who was the student of David Davis, my pastor, his name is Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington was a student. Has anyone ever heard of Denzel Washington? Denzel Washington is one of the top. Anyway, it's not important right now, but David Davis on Broadway said to me, come to Israel and serve with us in our congregation. And David Davis became not only my pastor, but one of my best friends. And as he was the man who founded the work at the House of Victory, and he chose me to be the leader of the place. Well, I can't remember, I think it was four years ago this past May, David Davis went on to be with the Lord. But two months before David Davis passed away, the Kopatolim services of Israel acknowledged the need for him to receive a caregiver. And I don't know what his name was, but he was from the Philippines. And he came and served David Davis as David Davis was dying. And you know what this man had? He had a gift. He had a gift of worship. And whenever I came to visit David Davis on really his sick bed, his dying bed, this brother was worshiping the Lord, praising Jesus. What a gift from the Philippines to come to my pastor, to my friend, as he's dying and bringing in the presence of God into his home. What a precious man of God from your nation, one from amongst you. Amen. God wants to honor your nation because he has sent chosen vessels. You have been chosen by God to serve in this nation. And God wants his spirit to rest upon you because he has called you at such a time as this. He's called you to be men and women where the spirit of God is not only resting upon you, but that you will have the word of faith you will believe that our God, He reigns. He reigns on this mountain. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And even things may look hopeless, there is a shoot that's arising out of dry ground. It will be the branch. Hallelujah, that's His name. He is the branch. There was a little girl in the northern kingdoms of Israel. She was taken captive by the Syrians. And this young girl had as her master or her overseer a man who was in the military. In fact, he was the highest leader in the Syrian army. You know him. His name 
was Naaman. And Naaman was dying as he was a leper. But this little servant girl, even when she was part of that stump that was cut off, this girl could have very easily lost her faith. Just like Daniel and his three friends when they were carried off into Babylon, they could have very easily lost their faith. But they made a commitment that they will not defile themselves with the things of this world, the things of this world. And these men sought after God. They got visions from God. God spoke to them. God wants to speak to you in the home that you are living. He wants his spirit to rest upon you so that you can speak spirit words of life. Spirit words of life that, that will give hope to even to those who are dying. But you know the story of this little servant girl serving in Syria. Naaman, who's dying of a sickness that there was no cure for leprosy. This little girl spoke the word of faith. Oh, if only, he said to him, this man's wife, if only he knew the prophet from Samaria. If only he would go to Elisha, one of Elijah's disciples. If only he would go there, the Lord would heal him. Hallelujah. This little girl was used in a mighty way by the Lord to touch this man's life. And it was kind of a long story. We know this man was insulted. Elisha didn't even come out. He didn't greet me at the door. He told me to go dip in the Jordan. I'm not going down to the Jordan. But he went. And after seven times, God completed the healing work. Oh, hallelujah. May we have this measure of faith to speak. So here is this little servant girl. The question is this, as the Spirit of the Lord rested upon Yeshua, the Spirit of the Lord wants to rest upon us. The Bible said, I read the verse in, in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, the Spirit shall rest upon my servant. That's a question for you tonight. Are you here today? Are you laboring in Israel as faithful servants of the Lord Almighty? You know, in the years I've lived, I mean, you know, call it kavod. Congratulations. It's been 11 years since that you've been here. Well, I don't want to disappoint you, but the Apostle Paul said these words. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I should say, you're not there yet. After 11 years, you have not arrived. As Paul said these words, I finished. I finished my race. I fought the good fight. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There's a let's hope that no one can say tonight, I finished my race. You got a long journey ahead of you. I remember, I remember being at my 11th anniversary. Wow, that was, that was 16 years ago. Anyway, are you today a faithful servant? Are you serving the Lord today? You know, in the journey, you need to have a word spoken to you in your life. I one time heard a man use an expression that when he said it like this, how many of you tonight can say that you have a life verse? I said, a life verse? What, what, what's a life verse? Do, do I have a life verse? And when I understood what a life verse is or what it means, I said, <laughs> of course, I've got a life verse. My question to you tonight, how many of you have a life verse? Or should I even ask, I've got a couple of hands, but 
Maybe I could add, do you know what a life verse is? I define it like this. A life verse is something that will sustain you, something that will carry you in the midst of hardships and difficulties. I, I, I want to uh, go back to one or two of my life verses. I just want to, I want you to know I'm, I'm closely watching the clock and I was given a fair amount of time to deliver this message and I was given liberty to keep talking if I felt like it and I said I'll stop if I see anyone falling asleep praise the Lord you all been so wonderful there's nobody sleeping you might regret that later but the word of God in his life verse I was in New York City. I was in New York City. I had been serving the Lord in New York for one year. And you know what? I, I was tired. I was weary. And you heard in, my, in the introduction, I was working with homeless drug addicts in the streets of New York. And it was a little bit of a challenge. It was a little bit of a difficulty. I went down to New York City after graduating from Bible school. Or as you heard, I went to Bible school because I wanted to prepare for what I believe was the call of God to come to Israel. And when I was in the Bible school, God spoke to me right at graduation. I said, Lord, where am I going? What am I doing? I don't know what to do next. I came here to prepare, but now what? And the still, small voice of the Lord said these words, Israel, fire, New York. Wow. I, I didn't know what that meant, actually. But I knew that somehow, for me to come to Israel, I would have to go to New York City. Now, I had actually been to Israel a few times. I had flown out of New York City four times. So I knew. Yes, going to, to Israel via New York, done that before, been there, sure, no problem. But what I didn't know was that I was going to have a two and a half year layover waiting for the plane to take me to Israel. I am walking by faith because I'm saying, Lord, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go. When am I going? So I'm in my first year of waiting, and I am tired, and I'm weary, and I'm beginning to doubt. Did I really hear the voice of God? Did God speak to me, Israel, via New York? My, my, my whole walk with Jesus and the call of God upon my life was dependent on this, what I believe was from God. And now I'm beginning to doubt, and I'm ready to quit, and I'm ready to go back home to Boston. And suddenly, one day, I came home to my little apartment room, and under the door was an envelope. And I tell you, I was walking by faith back in those days. I still walk by faith. But what I mean by that is, I'm living in the most expensive city in the world. And I am not making one shekel. I'll say not even a dollar. I wasn't making money. I was a volunteer living by faith. I had no money. And I come in to the room, and there's an envelope on the floor. And I gotta admit, I, I mean, I'm sure you think I'm a spiritual guy. But in that moment, my hope was that in that envelope was a little money. And when I picked it up and I opened it, there was no money. And I was disappointed. But when I, I read what was written in it, it was just these words. And the word said this, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and which you have ministered, and you will continue to minister to his saints. When I read those words, I fell down on my knees. I got on the side of my bed. 
and I began to cry. I asked God to forgive me for not trusting, for not believing, because I was weary, I was tired, and I was ready to quit. I was ready to go home. But this word gave me strength. This word put power in me. I arose as I waited upon God. He renewed my strength. I mounted up with wings as eagles. Two and a half years, or a year and a half later, I was invited to Broadway to have lunch and dinner with David Davis, and he invited me to come to this place and work. To God wants to give us a verse. He wants to speak to us a word that would give us power and might. So it's not enough to come to this land. So many people who make Aliyah and they don't know the Messiah of this nation, our hearts need to weep and be broken for them. Because there's nothing in this land, the pride, the glory, the prestige, the hope, it's not enough. We need the spirit of the living God to be resting upon us. But let me just share a few more moments here. But when I came here, now you, you well, I can refer back to uh, my, how could I say, an introduction. I didn't know you were going to read all of that, but it was nice to hear it. Uh, anyway, but if you read or, or you remember what, what it said, I was at the university. I was studying Jewish history. I was an unbeliever. But there, as I studied Jewish history in the Middle East, uh, someone said to me, hey, <laughs> If you want to know Jewish history, you need to read the Bible. And I said, read the Bible? Read the Bible? I said, read the Bible? He said, no, no, no. I mean, it's Jewish history, it's all the story, and it even tells their future. I said, it tells their future. So I got me, got me curious. I began to read. That's how I became born again. And in the moment I became born again, that's how I believe the call of God, God, send me to Israel. That was the first prayer I can honestly say I ever prayed. Well, I prayed to receive Jesus into my heart. The next day, I said, Lord, send me to Israel. That was in 1982. And now, it's 1992. I'm invited by Dr. David Davis to come to Mount Carmel. And here I am on this mountain. And I'm here in September. It's hot. In September, October, it was, hot. it was like the hottest years in the history of Israel. I'm exhausted. Come November, only after three months, I wanted to go home. I've waited 10 years for God to send me to this land. And I was so lonely. I was missing my family. I'm an uncle, as the youngest of eight family members, I am an uncle of like 40 nieces and nephews, and I have lost count of their children, which makes me a great uncle. I am a great uncle. I was a great uncle even when I was just an uncle, but now I'm really a great uncle. Anyway, I was so lonely. I wanted to go back to America. I was ready to give up on the call of God for my life. And in the midst of difficult moments, like that tree cut down the stump of Jesse, God spoke a word to me because he knew I needed a word. Have you ever been to that place where you need a word? You need God. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And so he spoke to me this verse. In, in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 18. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit. And he was in the desert until his public showing in Israel. When God spoke this word, I got up out of my chair that I was sitting in. I got down 
on my knees once again by the side of my bed, not in New York, but in the city of Haifa. And I began to weep and to cry because God convicted me, showed me how much of a little baby I was. Truly, I was a child in the wilderness and I needed to grow strong in the spirit. Brothers and sisters, we are challenged. We are challenged by the commitment that we have made in this land, and we are challenged by the commitment we have made to the Lord Yeshua. But Jesus said these words, and with this we'll come to a close in Matthew, the 25th chapter. I, I, I would call this part of uh, my, my vision in my serving of the Lord this is one of the things that, that gives me strength having this vision you, some of you might have heard the expression the 1040 window it talks about the most unreached area in the world the 1040 window well this is the 2540 window and it says here in Matthew the 25th chapter Verse 40, and the king shall answer unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done this unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Brothers and sisters, in many ways, we could be serving the least of all the brethren here in this land. And yet, we need to know this, that as we serve him, as we serve the people of this land, we are doing it for the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. I'm going to ask you if you could all stand, maybe some of the worship team, uh, I understand, will come forward.